Hello, hello. You're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Good morning, America. Hi, Robin. How are you today? Hey, morning, Chris. I can't complain. Life is good. And is it all sunny over in Hamburg? <laughs> well, as sunny as it gets in January. Um, audience, we've recorded this at the end of January. And honestly, it's been raining cats and dogs today. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, speaking of the recording, um, we have had a very intense session with our second startup guest, uh, on the show, and and I can't wait to to share this with our listeners. Yeah, so this one is with Tom Pace of NetRise. NetRise analyzes firmware associated with extended IoT devices, like medical devices and embedded systems, which is not a space I knew much about before the interview. But like all technology, it comes really really interesting when you look at the problems people are dealing with and how startups can solve them. And I love discovering these little worlds that open up to enormous universes once you get to understand them. Yeah. Well, I, I've done quite a bit in the um, in the IoT and the industrial IoT space. Uh, so a lot was somewhat familiar. Uh, really nice to get it back in touch with um, again. So what, what I think um, made the chat with Tom so valuable um, again was two things. Uh, first, um, his business represents a situation that is so typical uh, for many startups. They are real innovators. So it's a very nascent market, no existing Alice reports on their topic. And, and I think listeners will hear in the interview um, and in our summary afterwards, how this is exactly what analyst relations is meant for. And, and two, um, Tom touched on several really critical points that I believe are on the minds of many of our listeners. Some of this we discussed right in the conversation. And again, we'll get back to some others in more detail afterwards. Yeah. So he's a great example of how building the analyst relationship on a shoestring can lead to amazing results if you've got the right experience or guidance. So let's listen in. So here we go. Wonderful. We've got Robin Schaffer again, myself, and we've got a person called Thomas Pace of a company that I can read in the background, Nevrise. Thomas, I, I don't know who you are. You got recommended to us by um, a previous um, interview partner on the show. Um, so tell our audience who you are um, and, and why we're talking to you um, about the state of startups with industry analysts, potentially. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, so I'm Tom Pace, co-founder and CEO of NetRise. Uh, we are a company that is providing visibility and risk identification to a class of devices that historically has had none, um, known as XIoT, Extended Internet of Things. So IoT, ICS, medical devices, embedded systems and vehicles, telecommunications equipment, etc. Um, you know, I think the the nature of the conversation is really around how startups um, view working with analyst relations and, and what kind of the best path is to, to do that uh, for folks that are either new to startups or maybe have worked with uh, other analyst relations in a, in a prior life. Okay. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, spot on. Um, so um, can you can dive into um, what your company does a little bit deeper um, for, so everybody is very clear about, you know, where you're coming from, what you're solving, how are you doing that, um, like the, the one minute pitch if you can. Yeah, so, um, I mean, like I said, we provide visibility and risk identification to those devices, and the way that we do that is by analyzing the firmware of those devices. So the reason you have to do it that way is because you know you can't install a software agent on a security camera or a router or a switch. Um, 
I mean, I guess, suppose technically you 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 can go that route, uh, but that that creates very very challenging and and lengthy sales processes because then you're working with like engineering teams to close every single deal, which can be um, basically very not scalable. Um, and so by analyzing essentially what is considered the operating system uh, of these devices, you get visibility that is not really able to be um, provided from other solutions in the market, which are which tend to be very network centric uh, around, hey, does this device exist? So they they solve problems such as the device identification, asset inventory, and also like network traffic analysis um, um, part of the problem, which by the way, it's people usually confuse us with competing with those companies and we, we don't whatsoever. Uh, we just take an inside out approach whereas they take an outside in approach and both of those things okay. are required to really solve the problem. Interesting, interesting. Very, very cool space that I knew nothing about. And so now I know more. So in this space that you're in, how do analysts play? Are they involved? Do they research it? Do they cover it? Um, do they have reports? You know, how does it work? Yeah, so it's an incredibly nascent space. Uh, so I would say that the coverage from analyst relations firms has been very, very little. Um, yeah. There, there are some, there are some companies out there that have, you know, they intersect with this market slightly from like a Venn diagram perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, the other I think issue you run into here is everybody hears the word firmware. And they associate that with like a particular company. Um, oh. it, it, it's similar. It's similar to saying like we do operating system security and putting all of those eggs like in one company basket where there's like hundreds of companies who do operating system security. So same kind of thing here uh, where even though a particular company might be doing, you know, firmware security, that can mean, you know, a million different things. So the coverage here has been pretty limited. There is no name of the market. Uh, I've seen companies listed under software composition analysis. I've seen companies listed under vulnerability management. I've seen companies list, listed under DevSecOps. I mean, those three things are <laughs> wildly different. Oh, so you can begin yeah. to see the challenge. So, yeah, so it's, I, it's very it's very evolving still, and and people are I guess fighting about definitions and discussing you know what what is what and and how do we you know, differentiate things and and all that. I have to say I find this very uh, Tom really really common with startups that they have because they are innovating because of their nature they have come out with a new way to do things and they've seen a need in the market and they're innovating that it doesn't fit into natural categories. So I, I find that most uh, interesting, innovative startups have that, that problem. Robin, I think we're, we're getting here very much to the point of what analysts told us on the on the SEER report, why they are so interested in, in talking to startups, because these companies are, are, you know, have no respect for the status quo of a market. You know, they're challenging everything. They're putting things on its head and they're finding new ways, new solutions. And and it reminds me of the one um, comment that we got that um, an analyst said, well, I want to speak to startups because they challenge my thinking, you know? Um, and that sounds very much like it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, there's two categories. The... Excuse me? I was just going to say, I think there's two categories of startups here that get viewed very differently. Okay. So you have you have startups that are say they're doing something better. And then you have startups that are doing something new. And those are two totally different things. Yeah. So I came from Silence, which was an antivirus company. Mm -hmm. Antivirus existed for 30 years before Silence existed. But we we said we can do it better. Okay. Um Whereas at NetRise, we are doing something new. There is no <laughs> firmware analysis magic quadrant that we're looking to penetrate. Uh, it doesn't exist. So this idea that all startups are the same and have this like same relationship with analyst relations is just, it's just not accurate. Um, so 
you know. Yeah, I think I think it's a really really helpful distinction. Thank you, Tom. I I see I see it also. So. Well, good, good by the way, you. who who are the analysts that you think are are at the moment, you know, analyzing this this field in whichever shape or form? Who who are the houses that people should have on the radar? Who have you seen? You mean the, which which analyst firms? Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, Gartner has um, put some things out there. Uh, it's been around software composition analysis, and they also just put out a report um, related to DevSecOps tools that we are mentioned in, which is which is great. I'm appreciative of that. Um, but do I do we sell to personas um, that exist in the DevSecOps tools realm? Yeah, uh, we do. Is that like, is that our only go to market? Like if you think about like a sneak, something like that, whose who's primary go to market is to sell to developers, right? Then, then like, but that's not ours, right? So it's, it's, it's just impossible to say um, like how, how that will go over time. Because potentially, and I'm not saying this is the case, and frankly, I don't think that it is, there is a potential where an analyst firm can put you into a category that you don't even want to be in and, and you don't even get a vote. Like I had no idea we were being put in this report. They're just like, Hey, you're in this report. And I was like, okay. Um, so it's not really, <laughs> there's not really a, you know, a well-defined kind of process here to figure out like what's what um, they're really the only one I've seen talk about this space um, explicitly, um, I suppose. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So definitely some white space to, to cover on the honest side. You know, there's been some reports that have come out from like the, maybe it was, maybe it was Forrester or the Ponemon group or some Ponemon Institute, whatever about like the ROI reports, yeah. but meh, yeah. I'm always <laughs> mad on those. I mean, have they ever released a report saying there is not ROI? For this product because if there is one i'd like to read it uh, <laughs> that would be an interesting one to read i agree wouldn't it be wouldn't it be amazing if they were like hey we partnered with these guys and you won't believe it we couldn't find any roi <laughs> um you know i think the vendor <laughs> might might uh might not uh, want to publish that one or promote it yeah somehow that's never happened though yeah well i i, I have seen reports that were you know very critical of of products and um or uh, even categories and uh, he said, um, you know, that's a thing of the past. It's just not working anymore. And that kind of is equivalent to no ROI. But I agree, a, a, you know, a bit of bluntness would be quite nice once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, to your point, like an example of that would be like signature based antivirus, right? Like, hey, guys, this thing, this technique of stopping malware is like not effective anymore. Right. Yeah, I mean, one one of such statements is for, if we're talking about Gartner, you know, the discontinuing of a certain magic quadrant just says that this kind of category has either morphed into something else mm -hmm. because the the criteria have changed, the you know the the market drivers have changed, the customer requests have changed, and all that, and so um, the products, the category has morphed into something else, or it's not relevant, or it's been taken over by something else. Or the entire magic quadrant, if you look at it as a as a field of play, because they've been added um, criteria to the to the questionnaire, has maybe moved to something you know slightly as as an entire market field, which means some players drop off the field, others come into the field, and because it's been moving you know by quite a distance over the last one two years, they've decided to rename the whole thing. And that kind of says, you know, yeah, that category is kind of died. And if you're still on that, um, yeah. Yeah, it does give you, it give you that insight. So, so Tom, tell us about your background with analysts, you know, where you've worked with them in other companies and how you see them um, helping NetRise now. Yeah, so my history in working with analyst relations firms um, basically began when I was at Silence. So I was um at the time, I think I was probably like a senior director of worldwide consulting. Um, 
So I was uh, participating in like the incident response wave report for like Forrester. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that was like the primary POC. Like I wrote up our entire submission, our entire deck, did the whole That's presentation. Smart, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got placed really, really well. We did better than a whole lot of companies way bigger than us. Um, and so I did a couple of those and we did pretty well. So they basically asked me if I would come and help out on the product side as well. Um, so, I mean, this was just an additional responsibility. It wasn't like I was head of analyst relations. I was not. Um, so I, I ended up getting promoted to like a global vice president role. But um, so I helped out with like our magic quadrant submission for like endpoint security, which, you know, is a knife fight to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, so participated in dozens of briefings and meetings and going to the Gartner conferences and flying to London for the conference. I mean, like, you know, full court press, analyst relations, trying to get yourself placed in the magic quadrant. Um, so that was the goal, right? This yeah. idea, I, I always think it's funny when companies talk about like, yeah, these are the goals of participating in with Gartner. And it's like, there's only one goal. There's only one. And that's get, being in the upper right-hand corner of the magic quadrant, if there's a magic quadrant. Right. That's the goal. So, uh, and that was our goal. And so in terms of how I think they can help us out is really understanding like how to define the market. Um, what, I mean, we, we, there's only like two or three companies in like the world doing what we are doing. So, you know, it, it, to me, what's most interesting about how they would help is are people asking about this and reaching out to you about the problem? That's really it. Because I, I have a very difficult time understanding how someone who's not doing what we are doing is going to have a better perspective on what, how the market is shaping up, right? Because once again, we are a new solution. We are not a, like, I wouldn't, ex I wouldn't expect um, like silence to go to Gartner and say like, Hey, you know, um, we have no idea how to build a go-to-market for this company. Like, yeah, you do. It's an antivirus company. Like everybody knows how to do that. Like, you know, who to sell to, you know, what to go to market. You're going to go through these partners. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. Like, cause that's a well-established thing. And Gartner can be very helpful there. Right. Well, that doesn't exist for us. Um, so there is no data. There is no like, well, this company did it this way. There, that doesn't, there, none of that is there. So it's really, it's really like an awareness exercise. Mm -hmm. And are any customers asking about this? Mm -hmm. That's really where the state of analyst relations is related to what we are doing in NetRise. Yeah, I think educating the analysts is a huge part of educating the market for something like what you do. The mm -hmm. more they understand that, you know, which is uh, basically briefing them, getting on their map doesn't cost anything, you know, and, and talking to all the analysts that play in this space, yep. planting ideas in their head that they can discuss with clients is a great way to educate and warm up the market for yourself. Well, I'm, I'm getting That's that kind of, um, you know, using them as an extension to your own brains and say, you know, what, what have you heard? How did these potential clients phrase their questions, you know, from what, you know, wh wh where are they coming from? What's their context? You know, are they using the same language as we are? Are they thinking about this in different terms that maybe, you know, Ed can can give us some feedback of, you know, altering our, our proposition slightly to, to talk their language and, uh, you know, these kind of things. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, you run into some problems where it doesn't, I won't mention like vendor names, but you'll, you have companies out there who essentially are claiming to do like, let's just call it IOT security, right? They're like, yeah, we do IOT security. And they've, they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. They have all this marketing out there, um, show telling people that they do IOT security. I mean, it takes me five seconds to tell you that they don't do it do what they say they're doing. Right. Um, but that's, I'm swimming upstream with cinder blocks tied to my ankles. Like, because 
I'm a seed stage startup company trying to convince these people who have enormous contracts from these vendors that they actually don't do what they say they're doing. Um, and that's not exactly a, an easy position to be in. That's a so. very interesting one. Um, I think uh, that is not uncommon, you know, that there are vendors no. making claims and you know better, you know, and you know the market, you know, really well. And how do you share that and educate the analysts to be aware of the distinctions in a positive way because bashing you know as you know you know in all of life bashing these competitors is not going to get you anywhere especially well, that's what's really this. funny about it we don't exactly. even view them as competitors that's what's funny about it we don't even view them as competitors right yeah. like i mean they they're complementary to right. us and that's luckily for us that's very easy to prove in right. a like very quantitative way um, and so th that's, that's really the approach. Um, now if people are being like legitimately disingenuous, that's a different thing. Um, but you know, we really don't see that. I don't think, I, but I do think you see some, you know, aggressive marketing. Um, uh, but that's, that's just part of the course, right? That's do you, not, do you think, do you think that the analysts perceive them as competitors? Because that's what happens a lot. The analysts, even though you know they're not competitors, the analysts put you in the same lump in their head and might, you know, communicate that to, you know, potential clients. Is that something you come across? Sometimes. Uh, I, I, frankly, I couldn't really say that analysts have done that because I haven't talked to enough of them. Okay. Um, but prospects and customers will say things like that, like, oh, mm -hmm. um, well, can you guys explain to me how you're different than your competitor clarity? And I'm like, well, I got, got, got good news for you. Um, we don't compete with them at all. So uh, things, things like that. Yeah. I find that super interesting because um, in a way, even if they're not the same category as you, and even if they're doing something else and you say, well, they're complementary, you're kind of still competing with them. And if it's only just for attention, and it, or for you know their your competitor misleading the market in a way that you disagree with, and you need to educate the market, and um, and doing this through someone as influential as a leading analyst house is a very elegant way and a very powerful way is because they're they're leading so many conversations and you can use. If you can, if you can educate the analyst about no, 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 there are sev several differences here. They are, you know, not, they're not their buyer. They are just interested in facts, in reality, in differentiation. That's what they're all about. So that's why you will be super interesting to them. And that is also how they get their own market value communicated to their end customers, to potential buyers who reach out to analysts to kind of protect them from overly confident marketing. So what you're describing there is kind of the perfect situation, both for a startup like yours or, and for the analysts as well, because that is exactly how they generate their, their own market value by understanding these nuances yes. and being able to prove them, as you say, with facts, with data, in a structured, systematic way, that you know helps them generate the value for their end clients. So uh, I love it how we, how you just described it. It's it, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Good. I like to talk about um, some of the investments that you you know might consider as a startup in some of these uh, firms because many startups I talk to you know kind of misunderstand how money can help them in the analyst relationship relations world and it's not a pay for play environment so you can educate and brand you know get that awareness and, and education to the analysts without spending any money however subscriptions and insights and you know using them for content marketing does cost money so what's your perspective on spending money with these firms we haven't spent any money on, on them mm -hmm. would be the first thing i would say yep uh, That's I good. think, pardon me, which is that a good thing. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, especially given 
current market conditions and and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I when I talk to folks about whatever it is, we want to grow more pipeline, we want to get more awareness, we want to mm -hmm. hire this kind of person, like whatever the problem is, mm -hmm. the number of times I hear from like people who I trust or maybe their advisors or on the board or investors or whatever is like, oh, well, well Tom, you, you didn't, you didn't think of this or try this or do that or try that. It's like, guys, uh, this idea <laughs> that like every decision that I need to make and every set of criteria that I need to like analyze and walk through is like in a vacuum and equal is unbelievably false. Um, so like things have priorities. And so for me to just be like, yeah, uh, this is the thing that has to trump everything else is like, is, is, is really hard. Um, so we, yeah, we, we have not made investments there. Uh, we built some like briefing decks and things like that and scheduled some briefings with folks. Um, so that would, that's basically the extent, um, in, in, in which we have gone down, um, at this point. So. And, and how do you handle it so far? Do, do you do this yourself or do you do this through your marketing folks or do you use your product people or who, who's handling it? I'm flattered to think that you have, we have a marketing team. Um, <laughs> you're talking, you're, you're talking to them. So, okay. you know, we, luckily we have a, we have a bunch of folks here who have done uh, a handful of work in analyst relations, mainly on the product management side. Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely the most mature and person in terms of, you know, knowing how to interact with analysts and knowing what they want to hear and knowing, you know, what they want to see. So I'm, I'm taking that on myself. Um, obviously I don't, I create a, a good amount of the content and get it looked at by everybody to see how it looks. Um, I mean, as you guys know, we have a former Gardner analyst that's an advisor at NetRise. So, uh, obviously we we appreciate and understand the value he can bring. Yeah. So there is that. Um, but no, I'm the primary uh, person who who does those things. And you know, I've seen analyst relations teams do way more harm than good. Um, yeah. And especially early on, like you can't afford that. Um, and so, like people remember what you say to them and. And, and and if that relationship isn't a positive one, we can all we can all sit around and pretend like that's not going to have an impact on you in the future. But that's just not the way human psychology works. Um, so I want to immediately zoom in on this. So what what do you think are the th are the things that are done wrong by analyst relations teams? Um, what you know? Um, I mean, I think I think. I, I've I've seen and heard people basically, I mean, for lack of a better word, like talk down to analysts in certain ways, like, hey, you don't understand what we're doing yeah. kind of thing. Um, and like as a startup, that's like by definition to some extent, right? Um, right. It's like, like that's, no one knows what you're doing. That's why you created the company. Right. Um, but But knowing how to convey that in like an appropriate manner is 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 very important um also like you know i mean you have things like not maintaining the right kind of cadence um you have people that just lie about like roadmap uh and and, and, and things like that um so fairly obvious things i think for the most for the most part um you know just not delivering on what you say you're going to deliver on i mean startups have to be like wildly optimistic like people um but you have to temper that when you're dealing with analyst relations so like i would actually probably say like you always want to be conservative when you're talking to like your board right i would say you probably even want to be more conservative when you talk to analyst relations um because your board will forgive you <laughs> analyst relations will not um so I often tell my clients um, um, that their goal is to deliver a memorable, compelling briefing that will wow an analyst, right? I mean, that's what their goal is. And 
delivering a poor briefing is far worse than delivering no briefing. Better not to be on the radar at all than to totally get agree. that kind of kind of experience. Totally agree. Yeah, that's right, and that's why I, that's why I'm the person leading the charge. Right? Is like it's not until thing. not until that cadence is established, not until we have the rapport that I expect to have with the people I need to have it with. Am I willing to bring in other people and transition that over? It just the stakes yeah. are too. That's and frankly, that's one of the problems. Like that's one of the problems is you can bury yourself. And and have like a difficult time getting out from under that, and that um and I I know for a fact because I have a million friends who are startup founders who are just like yep we're not even bothering them, we're not even going to go down that road because everyone doesn't have analyst relations experience like I do right so they're not they're not going to go put their foot in their mouth, uh and so they're just going to do nothing, so I yeah. think that's really wise really true really insightful. Yeah, so I think um, I think you know one one thing that's on my mind is thinking about the analysts or from the startups or from the VC accelerators that support the startups. What's your one wish? What do you wish would happen in this ecosystem um, to make it better? I wish there is a more proactive willingness to work with startups. Um, you know, like a Gartner subscription cost, I think $60,000. My yearly cloud costs aren't $60,000. Yep. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like that's, I, or like base pricing based on maybe the amount of rev, amount of money you've raised, the amount of revenue, like, I don't know, maybe some other metric in which that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I can't think of a single startup that's a, probably a pre-A round. Like you're not going to be able to recognize all that value because right. you're not going to be able to dedicate the appropriate amount of resources to it. Like buying a subscription is one thing. So, but being able to actually dedicate the time, energy, and resources to generate the maximum value associated with that subscription is just not something that most pre-Series A and probably even pre-Series B startups have. Um, okay. It just isn't. So, like, there's exceptions and, you know, whatever. Uh, but, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe at the big Gartner conferences uh, or any of them. We're just I'm, – I'm not even picking on Gartner. It could be IDC. It could be Forrester. It could be sure. whoever. Like – Okay, they have what, like five big ones a year or something like that. Maybe they have a pass that's two thousand bucks, and if you're a startup, you can attend and like give briefings to analysts in person or something. I don't know. There's a million things they can do. Yeah, um, yeah. I wish so like that quite 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 often that startups are wishing for more, you know, a, a gradual you know way of tapping into this entire ecosystem and into this field, you know, it, it aligned to their growth journey. So start small, start, you know, with some individual interactions before you can go full all in. Mm -hmm. So we've heard that quite a number of times, yes. I mean, listen, these guys, <laughs> here's one thing I know for sure. They don't need business advice from me. Um, that's, I'm up. If there's nothing else that we can be sure about, that's it um in this conversation but uh i don't know what what calculus they're doing on the back end but from the folks i know which is a, a decent number of people who've started companies or or who are running them now they just choose to spend zero dollars right right so yeah. and to me it's not about like to me a fifty thousand dollar contract for gartner probably means very little compared to like a $10,000 or a $5,000 contract, especially if you now have a couple hundred more customers, right? In the startup space, that's the game. Like if it was $5,000, sold, not even a question, yeah. done, right. right? And then they have access to all this early stage innovation, in my opinion, right? And right now they're just not getting it. Um, unless people have the wherewithal to submit for briefings proactively. But I know a ton of people who are like engineers who start companies or whatever. They don't even know that they exist. Right. Yeah. 
Right. So I think, uh, you know, the conversation I frequently have with my clients is, you know, how do you start for no investment? How do you start getting on their map, getting on their radar, um, educating them awareness and as much as you can get without investing, let's go there before we think about if there's ROI and making some of these investments, which comes down the line. So I'm always urging clients and startups, don't get, don't hold back because you're not ready to invest. There's plenty you can do without investing to get started and get a pretty far long, uh, along the way. And yeah. as I say, Tom, there's, there's also the other side of the equation. You know, you, it, it, when you engage with them, you really want to make use of whatever you get as insights into your business. And that takes serious work, yeah. time, effort, and maybe even investment again as well, uh, because otherwise you've clearly wasted your time. It's not just about, you know, getting your message out to them. It's also about getting all this into the business and doing something useful with it. So that when you talk to them again, you can feedback on what you've learned and what the market response has been, and thereby, you know, build your credibility with the analyst. And at some point, be um, a company that suddenly, as you just demonstrated, appear on an on an influential report. Yeah, I think the challenges, like the product market fit and go to market dynamics, are very skewed for startups. So, what do I care about more? what my prospects and customers are saying or an, a big analyst relations firm who doesn't have a person assigned to my problem space. Um, and so it just be, it's, it's just a time prioritization problem at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Like that's just what it is. Yeah. And so it's, it's like everything has value. It's ne so that that's like always the thing. It's not like this isn't valuable, but it's like, if I can spend, two hours with existing customers who are already paying me money to understand how to make our product better. Is that a better use of my time? Right. Or is it a better use of my time doing this other thing? Um, whatever that other it's thing is. Act. It's a balancing act. I totally yeah. get it. So you as CEO really have a lot of these challenges right on your plate because you've got a busy, busy, busy calendar and you have to use your time appropriately. We've, we've been there. We've all and there's no there. right answer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it might be an answer today that's different from the answer tomorrow. Um, oh, 100%. As you get more mature, analyst relations firms' value becomes much more clear, right? Like, absolutely. Like, it, it becomes, like, fairly undeniable, I think. Um, unless you're doing something, like, wildly bespoke. Um, or, like, you're only selling to the Department of Defense or something like that, right. where it's just, like, it can't really be helpful. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's for sure. And, it, and in terms of doing things for free, you're right. There's a bunch of ways to do that. I mean, briefings are obvious, mm -hmm. um, reaching out to the analysts, like on LinkedIn that are covering your market. I've, I've done that. Yeah, um, smart. I, I, I benefit from have, 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 having had relationships with these people in the past, right? Like I'm able to get a meeting with some of these folks in a unofficial non-briefing capacity. Right. Right. So find people who know these people and make them your friends and then get them to introduce them to you under some other auspice or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't always need to be this super formal thing. Um, that's what you want to get to. That's but I mean, exciting. humans are humans, man. Um, so exactly. reach out to them. And as you figure out what they're writing research on and then write content that you think is going to be meaningful to them and then just email it to them um, or tag them in a LinkedIn post and say, hey, I was recently reading blah, blah, blah from Gartner's recent research and it motivated me to write this blog, elaborating, adding on to that research. Like there's things that costs you nothing. Um, so it's there's definitely advice. ways- Mm -hmm. Great, so, great advice. Great ideas. Cool. All right. So I think we got to uh, pretty much wind down. We've had a great conversation. I think my only other question is, we ask all our guests, is who should we interview next and why? And that would be considering other startups, you say you know many of them, or an analyst that you have a relationship with. 
or a someone from the VC Accelerator support community. Um, who, who comes to mind? I know these guys are doing some stuff with analysts already, so they'd probably be good. Uh, and they're 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 like at the same stage as me, roughly. Um, a company called Hidden Layer, and okay. the CEO's name is Chris Sestito. Okay. Um, so that would be my recommendation for someone to talk to. Fabulous. We'll we'll follow up on that and make that interview happen. We really appreciate your recommendation. No problem. Fantastic. That was a really insightful conversation, I've got to say. Thank you so much, Thomas, for spending the time with us. Have I feel you. like if, if we weren't talking over Zoom, um uh, we should do the same in a in a you know in a cafe somewhere or with a with a pint of beer. Um that could go for a long time, I assume. <laughs> so really sorry. Uh, happy to do both of those anytime. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Again, okay, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. No problem, guys. Have a great rest of the day. All right, great. Thank you so much. Take it easy. Bye bye. There was a lot of content in these 30 something minutes. And as we said in the intro, Tom touched on some very important aspects. So let's let's look at some of these again, Robin. Yeah. So first of all, he talked about a reality that by definition, every startup is facing because by definition, startups are thinking about things in ways that others haven't yet. And there is no Gartner Magic Quadrant or other report for that brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah, the, their observations and ideas, hopefully, are as new to the analyst as to everybody else. So ex except analysts you know, by intimacy means that they may be familiar with the exact needs and frustrations that you have observed and decided to take on. So this means you can get invaluable clues on your product market fit yeah. through their breadth and depth of insights, number one. And two, you can bulletproof your strategy, your messaging, etc. Exactly. And Tom made an important distinction between companies who set out to do something better versus others who do something entirely new. And they require very different AR strategies. Yeah, like 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 form follows function in, yeah. in architecture, you know, yeah. like engineering, right? So same in analyst relations. Yeah, and, and he also talked about the possibility of appearing in categories where you don't see yourself or being compared with vendors that you don't record, regard as playing in the same field at all. Yeah. And and I want to combine this with, um, you know, with his point about vendors muddying the waters with, with claims that are just not true or, or, or misusing terminology and categories. And that takes place every day, all day, all the time. Yes, and, and and if you allow this to happen and, and not actively work against it, your competitors will be establishing facts on the battlefield without you. And I've seen too many real innovators, large and small, kind of win the ivory tower beauty contest while others win the bloody market, you know? And this is so frustrating. Um, but this is where startups can really make industry analysts their sharpest weapon. Um, industry analysts are all about factualness and precise differentiation of, of terminology. And this is their domain because it's the basis for, for their ability to make usefully differentiated recommendations. You know, I, I, I used to say, untangle the spaghetti of vendors' tech language or you know, protect buyers from, let's say, overly confident marketing. That is what they do. And that is so important for real innovators because startups make very sharp distinctions in technology and solution design, et cetera, you know, to, to explain how their innovative approach delivers new value or maybe leap forward in a market or open up an entire category. So, by, by briefing an analyst with factual information and substantiating examples, you can equip the analyst 
you know, with all the smart and hard criteria that you have identified as truly separating hollow claims from reality in your segment. And, and that is gold for the analyst. Yes. Um, that is really what they need. And when they apply it, that becomes gold for you. Because, you see, depending on the weight of the analyst's voice in your segment, you may have, in fact, raised the hurdles for everybody who's faking it. Or, or you move the entire market, you move the entire playing field. And, and that can be a game changer uh, in your journey as an emerging vendor. I couldn't agree more. And by the way, you can do this through briefings alone as Tom did with NetRise. He was quick to point out that he had no funding, like a lot of startups, to put towards research, advisory, thought leadership. The funding is tight. So up till now, they've only used free briefings. And that got them, because of their concepts, on several high profile publications that impact their, their buyer's view of the world. And that certainly drives leads and deals. So don't think you have to hold back because you can't invest big time right now. There's plenty you can do at zero cost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Briefing the key analysts ensures that the strategic value of your product development really gets to the biggest lever in the market. So if anything, good briefings are your minimal viable analyst relations priority every startup in b2b tech you know and, and, and the sia survey uh, revealed some critical insights um of what makes a good briefing right maybe that's that's for another day to talk about yeah 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 and on that note for deeper engagements like the paid inquiries advisory thought leadership we heard again today that analyst firms should really consider the realities of startup funding and tailor their offers to startups growth journeys so that startups can begin to work with them at earlier stages. And Tom encouraged analyst firms to regard this not only from a product perspective where they sell to the startup, but to some degree also from an investment perspective where they get all this innovative thinking into their business too. Again, not the first time we've heard this. True and spontaneously, you know, I think that if an analyst that's briefed by a startup feeds back to their sales teams, to their business development teams, that what they've just heard could be market changing, then why not make that a qualification for a significantly reduced subscription for a startup? Exactly. As simple as that. It's give and take, you know, um, for say two years or so. I mean, Dear analysts, if you're listening, be pragmatic. You know, if, if you trust your own best analyst brains, you know, your analyst firm should go all in on such opportunities. That is interesting. And we should make that a conversation point with the next analyst firm we interview. <laughs> right. Yeah, why not? Why not? That's what it's all about, right? Close the gap. Yeah. So Tom also made a thought that really got me thinking. That was his view on the question, should he better spend two hours with a customer who's already paying and learn what he can improve in his product or spend the same time talking to an analyst that hasn't yet assigned anyone to the topic at all? I mean, like there's a, a there's a short term and a long term perspective here. I know what you mean. Um, let me put another angle to this also. Um, so in, in short, I don't buy the trade-off because you see one alternative is not a hundred percent useful without the other. Mm -hmm. So first the client feedback is invaluable, of course. And here's the connection. You need client feedback as a currency to educate an analyst, as we've discussed earlier, um, and vice versa. You need the analyst perspective, especially when the category isn't yet established to make sure that a single client doesn't lure you into a direction that doesn't tango with the rest of the marketplace. Right. Right. Right? Or, or put positively, to test if that client perspective can even appeal to a larger audience. You know? So yep. 
it is only a trade-off if you do not have the possibility to get analyst feedback. Um, so either through through inquiry rights, um, which cost money, um, and Tom's company wasn't there yet at, at the time, um, or on the merits of a briefing that is so interesting to the analyst that they engage in a conversation that goes far beyond the briefing because it just matters so much to their research. And making that happen, is exactly what analyst relations professionals are are there for. Yeah. Um, so, from that angle, I respectfully amend this perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's about like building a relationship, so you get that that input, and um, that's uh, takes some nuance to build that. So another point I found interesting was about analyst outreach and connection via social media. I find this a two edged sword. Because it can work, you can comment and engage in, in LinkedIn and other other force, but it can backfire terribly. So you want to be really careful. So anyway, in all, I found Tom's perspective really interesting and thought provoking. It was a great interview. Yeah, agreed. And <laughs> it was a lot today, wasn't it? Um, it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, so let's wrap things up. Um, as always. Um, Dear audience, you find all the contact details in the show notes uh, for Robin, for myself, for Tom Pace of NetRise. Go check them out. Um, and we want to hear from you. Um, what do you think about what we've discussed today? Um, what are your experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything? And what's the state of startups with industry analysts in, in your view? Correct. And, and as an outlook, we have some great interview partners scheduled already. A lot coming up. Our first analyst firm will be next. It's one of the superstars in a very specialized market segment, and they work closely with startups too. So best subscribe and get the notification. Yeah, I am very much looking forward to that episode. So thank you so much for watching today, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Goodbye.